Hello Internet and welcome to this, my video of this week, which doesn't really have a overall subject. What it does have is, well, I'm still working on my, um, I'm actually doing a lot of research right now and just trying to see how I can make this video I'm doing in a couple of weeks about the Battle of Vienna, my, uh, how to make that my magnum, magnum opus, magnif my magnificent octopus, my mag. <laughs> Sorry, old Blackadder joke. How to make that my magnum opus into something that's actually worthy of what I think that particular video deserves. So, I haven't planned for anything big this week or the next week. The next week is probably going to be another travel video, despite the fact that I know that most of you actually hate that. But, you know, I like doing them, so, yeah. This week, I'm going to do a history stuff, and I'm going to do it in full vlog style because a lot of these things don't really have enough pictures for me to work with and also again because right now I'm busy doing a lot of other stuff so I feel a bit lazy but what I'm going to do is talk about sort of like a bunch of stuff that's too small to get a video on their own but that I still feel is fairly interesting in and of itself and something that I do want to talk about even if it only gets to be like two or three minutes for each. So yeah, enjoy. Right, let's start with when Harold Bluetooth of Denmark captured, de defeated, captured and imprisoned the King of France. Now this is not something that is known to be a great thing, but in the early days of the Duchy of Normandy, which had, of course, been founded by a certain Rollo, who was probably um, uh, a f relation, a fam f family relation of the later Danish kings. He was probably a family relation of Ragnar Lothbrok, actually, or at least the people who have later become known as his sons. And thus was uh, his descendants were... Fam familiarly related to the later Danish kings Gorm the Old and his son and heir Harold Bluetooth or the one who would become Harold Bluetooth. Now Rollo's descendant, one of Rollo's descendant, a guy by the name of Richard, became duke at a very early age. He was in fact only a child and at this point the French king Louis the Fourth, I'm pretty sure, decided that it was time to move in and try to see if he could, you know, take over the regency of the duchy to make sure that no one was doing nasty things to the kid, who was, after all, one of his most important vassals. Others said that he basically wanted to move in and do nasty things to the kid, who was one of his most important battles, so that the Duchy of Normandy would revert to the throne, or at least to someone that um, the king had a more personal liking to than a descendant of some Nordic Viking raiders. And, well, he did. He brought in a lot of his uh, counts, he brought in some armies, went up there to take over government and protect the young Richard. Unfortunately for the king, a lot of the other people around didn't particularly like that, and the most important nobleman in Normandy at the time beside the duke was a fellow by the name of Bernard the Dane. He was, of course, named Bernard the Dane because he retained a lot of Nordic traditions and had a lot of connections uh, to, the, uh, to the Scandinavian lands. And he uh, sent a letter to Gorm the Old asking if, uh, could you please come down here and give us a hand with making sure that the king and his supporters does not, in fact, do nasty things to our very young duke. And, well, easy. The Gorm the Old said, yeah, sure, he's, he's family, let's, let's, help. let's help the kid. And sent his son, Harold, with a war fleet down to deal with stuff. And... Well, it worked, basically. The king, who was not actually in Normandy at this particular time, but was out doing other stuff, immediately marched up there, and Harold summoned him for a, um, for a, a peace conference so they could hash out things, because no one really wanted a war. Everyone just wanted to make sure that Richard was doing okay, and that, you know, he could take over the government of his duchy when he got old enough. 
Unfortunately, during this particular conversation, the King of France brought a uh, brought another count that had been uh, rather heavily involved with the death of Richard's father, and this annoyed the Vikings and the uh, Normans quite a bit until such a time as the negotiations broke down and it all turned into a giant fight. You know, the fight that no one had wanted and that everyone had knew known was coming. And in this particular case, Harold and the uh, Normans routed the French, captured the French king, put him in jail in Rouen, the uh, capital of Normandy at the time, killed 13 of his most powerful counts, and scattered his army. It... <coughs> I am sorry... As I have mentioned before, this is live, so something's going to happen. Well, sort of live, it's taped, but anyway. Um, well, the king was in prison, his army was scattered, his counts was killed, and, uh, well, the queen decided that, well, she needed to get him out. Uh, so she wrote to her uh, brother, who was Holy Roman Emperor at the time, but apparently, the Holy Roman Emperor at the time decided that he had already had enough of fighting those goddamn Vikings up in southern Jutland uh, without t too many results, so he would absolutely not bother to fight them in northern France on behalf of his annoying brother-in-law, because apparently his response was something like, eh, I think you guys can figure out how to deal with that on their own. She also wrote to several other, like, really powerful magnates around Fr France, and apparently Louis was quite um, unpopular, because as a general rule, uh, their response was, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you got yourself into that, uh, king boy, and you need to get yourself out of it. So eventually a treaty was made, the king gave up hostages, the king gave up you know, money to be released as things go, and the king signed a treaty that basically said, yeah, I will not mess with Richard ever again. So, yeah, that was basically how Norman, this was the moment Normandy went from being an important, but sort of an important uh, fiefdom of France with an important duke, but basically went in to become the sort of semi-independent power in northern France that would eventually conquer England, just because after that the French kings had to, at least to a certain degree, leave people alone until such a time Edward was way too late to rein them in again. So yeah, that's how the uh, King of Denmark captured the King of France. But you never heard that story. What else do we have? Well, we have the Count Council of Basel, or the Council of Florence, depending on how you look at things, which is actually a really weird one, because they were never really in Florence. They were in Basel, you know, up in Switzerland. But, well, anyway. I've already made a video about the Council of Constance and the ending of the Great Schism. If you haven't watched that, go watch it. It's one of the first ones I ever did, and I'm actually quite proud of it, also because that was what I wrote my uh, final... Uh, bachelor uh, assignment on during my college days. However, it was obvious to many that the Council of Constance had to a certain degree failed. It had not solved the question about papal supremacy versus con uh, conciliate, uh, uh, council, uh, conciliary supremacy, whether or not the church should be governed by a series of economical councils or by ecumenical councils, I'm sorry, or by just pure papal supremacy. It had also not really touched upon the reforming all the uh, internal problems with the church, like uh, corruption and, well, mostly corruption, to be perfectly honest, nepotism, all that, all that kind of stuff. So just before his death, Pope Martin V, who had been elected at... Uh, uh, Constance called for another meeting to try to hash out all these problems. This church council, I already mentioned, the Council of Constance sat for four years debating trying to get things out of the way. The Council of Basel lasted for 18 and they still didn't figure out anything. So to a certain degree you might be asking Sage, 
why is this council so important? Well, this council is so important because after having spoken for 18 years and not finding a solution one way or the other, well, to a certain degree, it ended they they figured out the conciliary versus papal supremacy thing because that ended with clear papal victory. The Pope would become supreme head of the Roman Church without really anyone having any kind of hold on him. Uh, but what they didn't manage to deal with was, of course, the reforms because none of the really powerful church leaders really wanted that much reform because, hey, you know, we need some income to people, and lots of the more, I would say, powerful um, uh, monastery monastery orders wasn't all that, like the Bened uh, Benedictines wasn't all that keen on, you know, returning to poverty and um, good morals when it came to uh, cash. So overall, nothing like that uh, would change. So why is this so important, a meeting no one has basically ever heard about would turn into an abject failure? Well, because it was such an abject failure, no one really bothered to discuss reform again. Everyone knew it was a lost cause. They could sit around for 18 years chatting away, spending a bunch of cash, getting absolutely nothing done. So, hey, why bother? We're It's 1449. It's the current year. We must bow to realities. Unfortunately, those realities then also meant that particularly in the uh, sort of Nordic countries around uh, Nordic Germany and Scandinavia, there were a certain degree of annoyance with this, primarily probably because they had different ideas about duty and what people should do with their life, and also because most of the money was funneled into more southern uh, coffers than theirs, and which basically meant that since no one bothered to talk reform after this, and since all the money went somewhere else, suddenly a lot of people were really, really, really willing to listen to this um, annoying and rather bad-tempered monk called Martin Luther 50 years later. So yeah, good job, Catholic Church. Shut yourself a tiny bit in the foot at that particular council. Now, didn't you? Right, next thing I want to talk about is the Battle of Sailor's Creek. The Battle of Sailor's Creek is one of the last battles, probably to a certain degree the last battle, um, of the Virginia campaign of the American Civil War. In early April, the uh, chokehold of the siege that General Ulysses Grant had on General Lee's uh, defensive lines around Petersburg and Richmond had become so powerful that Lee tried one last time to break them at a couple of offensive attacks, mostly around a place called Fort Stedman. All of these failed miserably. Lee had practically no soldiers left. Well, he had soldiers left, but he had no sort of way to replenish lost people. He was losing uh, deserters up to like a regiment per day. We're talking like thousand men per day just vanishing from his army. He had nothing to feed them. He had nothing to pay them. Things were generally bad. He had basically one chance. Abandon his, uh, the Confederate capital of Richmond and his siege lines around Petersburg and retreat uh, westwards, hoping to find supplies around Amelia Courthouse and Appomattox Courthouse or possibly at Farmville and then either move into eastern Kentucky or down to uh, North Carolina to unite with the other surviving Confederate army under Joe Johnston and hope to either defeat uh, Grant or the other primary Union army under General Sherman in detail and prolong the war until a, um, until a um, negotiated settlement could be made. This was basically folly at the time. Lincoln had been re-elected. The Republicans held massive... Um, majorities in the in congress nothing like this would have happened even if the war would have been would have been postponed but anyway it was lee's only chance and he took it he broke out and ran for amelia courthouse unfortunately at amelia courthouse due to a bureaucratic snafu he found a lot of ammunition but absolutely no way of transporting it so that was good and there was no food there was no shoes there was no clothes there was nothing he could actually use so 
he had to move on, and but more importantly, he had to rest his troops first because they needed some time to actually scour the countryside for anything even remotely resembling something edible. That meant that for the first time since the Overland Campaign in Virginia began, began nine months before, the Army of the Potomac had the possibility of outmarching the Confederate, and this particularly Philip Sheridan and his cavalry along with a very fast-moving 6th Corps under Horatio Wright did. And they actually managed to almost get in front of Lee. Now, he managed to sort of regain the situation. Of course, he didn't regain the situation because we're t talking like 5th or 6th April here and he surrendered four days later, so he didn't really regain the situation. But he managed to gain a couple of more days just by making a forced march towards Appomattox. However, at this point, Sheridan really wanted a fight, so what he managed to do was throw his cavalry between, in a small, tiny gap between Lee's main army and the corps under Richard Ewell, which comprised of nearly a quarter of Lee's entire force. And during a rather heated, if not necessarily particularly hmm, fair fight, it was quite one-sided. Uh, so much so, in fact, that the deliberate, that the decisive stroke was by uh, Sheridan's dismounted cavalry rather than Horatio Wright's Six Corps infantry, basically forced, surrounded, battered, and forced Yule to surrender. A uh, corps of nearly 18,000 troops with six major generals and Lee's third in command, or at least at this particular point, because of various other generals' death, third in command, was captured completely. Lee lost more than a quarter of his army, and it allowed Sheridan to ride around the northern flank as well, and basically, well, he made it first to Appomattox. This was the moment. So why is this important? Well, a lot of people have heard of Sailor's Creek, but since it was part of the Appomattox campaign, it's not usually that much mentioned, but Sailor's Creek were the moment where Lee realized it was over. He could not possibly fight his way out of this particular one. Even if he managed to get down to Johnston, he would be crushed between... He, he and Johnston could muster, perhaps at this point, 45,000 men. They would be... Un, and they were badly disciplined at this point. Bad morale, badly equipped, no food. They would be annihilated between the 217,000 veterans that Sherman and Grant could bring to bear in a pincer movement. So Sailor's Creek was the moment where Lee realized that even if he could find food at Appomattox, he could not escape. He could not win. The war was over. The only way he could have done was to dispose his troops and turn them into guerrilla forces. And this was something Lee, of course, absolutely not wanted to do. First of all, he realized the that even turning them into guerrilla forces to annoy the North would probably mean that they would actually be annoy annoying the South a lot more because most of them would turn into bandits. It would also mean the North would have to send troops into areas that would otherwise never have faced soldiers and uh, the horrors of war. So, yeah. Sailor's Creek was the moment Lee realized this was the end, and then four days later surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia to uh, Grant just outside Appomattox. And yes, it is true, by the way, that the, uh, just to bring that up, that the uh, peace of Appomattox, or the surrender at Appomattox, was signed in the front hall of a man who had moved to Appomattox, who had first lived at Bull's Run during the original uh, fi uh, battle of the war, where they had been fighting in his fr in his backyard, and had moved to Appomattox because it was such a sleepy little place that no army would ever want to go there. And then the war ended. So basically, yeah, the war began in his backyard and ended in his front hall. Yes, it is actually a true story. I'm so sorry. All right, next little thing. Geberecht, uh, Gebhard, sorry, Gebhard Leberecht von Blücher, my favorite German general of the Napoleonic era. Now, during the Waterloo campaign, and yes, I will do a Waterloo video one day too, probably the two-year anniversary if I keep this up so long. Blücher 
while in the uh, sort of run up to the um, Waterloo battle, Napoleon had one possible uh, objective. He had to split the Dutch British army from the Prussian army because if those two united they would have 200,000 troops and would simply overwhelm him with numbers. He did this by striking really fast, stealing a march on everyone, fooling people into thinking he would only move like a month later than he did and actually did manage to plant his army squarely between the Duke of Wellington and uh, Dutch Belgian army, uh, sorry, Dutch uh, British army and Blücher's Prussian army. <coughs> I am sorry. Two battles were fought. There was a battle at Quatre Bras, which where the French, unfortunately for them, failed to dislodge the British from their position and send them reeling back. Uh, Marshal Ney, uh, apparently, in to a certain degree, um, intimidated by his previous uh, encounters with the Duke of Wellington, failed to realize that he had almost three times as many troops at Quatre Bras as Wellington had and didn't attack with the Elan necessary, which was really weird because we're talking about Ney here. Ney, whose primary um, fighting style was just charge, ahead, charge everyone ahead and see where that took him. He was a brilliant gen he was a brilliant uh, commander in many ways, but his fighting style was not particularly subtle, to be frank. But anyway, that's what happened over there. However, uh, around five miles away at Ligny, Napoleon mauled the Prussians and drove them back. Unfortunately, because he was lacking uh, troops that were marching between the battlefields, again, one day I will tell you about Der Long's march, but otherwise look up Quatre Bras and Ligny and what, uh, what General Der Long did that day. Not really his fault, but he did it that day. He marched back and forth and his troops were absolutely no use either place. So Napoleon only managed to push the Prussians back, but not separate them from the British completely. What did happen, however, was that Blücher was um, trying to uh, sort of rally his troops, was uh, thrown off his horse and ridden over by his own cavalry. In fact, he was probably only saved from death or capture because some uh, aide-de-camp who managed to stay with him threw his own jacket over the over the prince marshal while he was lying on the ground, thus hiding the fact that this was basically a very, very high-ranking commander as the French milled around them. He then spent most of the night in some damp little cabin before managing somehow to make it back to his headquarters. Now, we're talking about a 74-year-old man who's just been falling from a horse and been ridden over by his own cavalry after having spent all day in a losing battle. So, again, why, what happened? Why is this such an important story? Well, his second, in, his second in command didn't particularly like Wellington. He actually thought Wellington was a scoundrel and would run away at the earliest possible time, leaving the Prussians to absorb the full power of Napoleon's blow, be destroyed, and uh, basically, I don't know what he was thinking. He didn't like Wellington a lot, and he was quite paranoid about Wellington's willingness to fight. So he was willing to retreat back towards the Rhine and wait for the Austrians and Russians that were coming before making another charge into uh, France. Now, this was something Blücher could absolutely not allow, he felt, because he had given his word to Wellington that he would march to Wellington's aid, if at all possible. And he also realized that if Napoleon was given yet another two or three months to prepare, Instead of having one battle to settle everything, it could turn into a protracted campaign that no one wanted. So, again, what do we do? Well, we rub ourselves with a liniment of rhubarb, drink ourselves a bottle of schnapps, go in, run roughshod over all our generals and say, we are marching, get on with it right now. To quote Bernard Cornwell, who I mentioned last week as having written the Sharp novels, let me just quote here. Forward, he was quoted saying, I hear you say it's impossible, but it has to be done. I have given my promise to Wellington, and you surely don't want me to break that, do you, children? Push yourself, my lads, and we shall have victory. It, it's simply impossible not to like him. It's Blücher. He's 74 years old. His army has just suffered a crippling defeat. He is... 
in incredible pain from the fall the day before. He is stinking yards away from a mixture of rhubarb and schnapps taken externally and internally. And all he's doing is basically being pure passion, driving his men forward by sheer force of enthusiasm and personality and allowing them to arrive at Plan Sinois and destroy the uh, the French hopes of uh, beating Wellington and leading to Allied victory at Waterloo and finishing off Napoleon once and for all. Again, you cannot but like Blücher. He's amazing. Um, yeah, one last thing. Basically, there were a couple of others, but since this was supposed to be a short little video and it's already reached in 25 minutes... So of course it has. One day, one day I will make a short video when I intend to. I swear one day I will manage. But I just need to talk to you about the Cherokee written language. Why is the Cherokee written language so important? Because it's practically the only written language in amongst Native Americans, at least on the North American continent, that was developed by a Native Americans, by the people themselves. More specifically, it was developed in the 1820s, around 1821, in fact, by a fellow by the name of Sequoia. Yes, like the redwood tree out in California, except in his case, it means either he walked like a pig because he, was, he, he had a limp, or it means that he was called the sparrow because he was very tiny. No one really knows, and apparently the word can have different meanings. I will leave it up to my Cherokee viewers to tell me whether or not uh, which one of them is probably the correct one. However, he felt like it was a really bad thing that the Cherokees didn't have a written language. First of all, he could see the use of a written language and he wanted them to have one of their own instead of just adapting the uh, white man's st uh, t uh, sort of way of doing things. Also because he felt like they needed a language that fitted their own, or a written language, a sort of fitted, an alphabet if you want to call that, that fitted their own language and style. Especially since this was the time where most of the Cherokee tribes were starting to get, how to put this, whiteified, if you can call it that. They were starting to lose their traditions. They were starting to obviously become, well, Reservation Indians. You can't really say that because they haven't been moved. They, they, the Trail of Tears hadn't at this point happened yet, and there was a lot of other stuff going on. But they have they had started losing their traditions, their way of life, and becoming well, not something he would like. So he wanted them to give them a chance to remember their own um, sort of past. So he spent a year trying to create this alphabet from scratch based upon Cherokee language word sounds. He didn't work his fields. People thought he became absolutely crazy. No one wanted to have anything to deal with him. But eventually, he managed to create about 88 characters that could be used to write down the Cherokee language. Only no one wanted to anything to do with it, because this was some crazy guy who came there talking about some weird stuff. So, what do we do? Well, only one thing to do then we go to the various tribal members and say, listen, this is what we can do. I want you guys to tell, to say to me a couple of words or three or four words, and I will write them down in this language. Then I will leave the cabin. You can send guards with me. My daughter, who knows this uh, written thing, will come in and read exactly what you have said from it. You have to be able to see how useful this could be to us. So that's what happened. And they saw how useful it could be to them. And basically, from around 1821, uh, where he invented it, to 1825, where it became official, almost the entire goddamn tribe learned to write with it. Both the tri uh, tribal members who had already moved voluntarily out to the Oklahoma Territory and the ones who remained in the old Cherokee heartlands of uh, Tennessee and North Carolina. So yeah. Four years from one guy had a crazy dream until everyone in the Cherokee tribe could write and uh, could read and write in their own language with their own alphabet. That's actually really impressive. It didn't probably change very much, although it to a certain degree allowed especially the eastern band of Cherokees that managed to escape the Trail of Tears to maintain a tribal and cultural cohesion that a lot of other 
uh, Eastern Indian bands simply haven't been able to. So yeah, good job on you, Sequoia. And with that, we're hitting the 30 minute mark. So I have decided not to talk anymore because otherwise the fact that I love the sound of my own voice could keep going, could make or make me keep going forever. So um, I hope you enjoyed some of these. Maybe want to get more information, read up upon them. If you have any questions, well, you know exactly where I am. So hmm. next week, it will probably be a travel video, as I mentioned before, just because I need to be absolutely ready for in two weeks when I want to make... I know the Battle of Siege of Vienna and the Battle of Kahlenberg isn't actually... Other people have done it. Other people have probably done it better, but it's the one video I have wanted to do since I started this channel, and I want to get it absolutely right. There's one particular moment that I want to make absolutely sure I get right. So, yeah, until then, I have been The Sage, and I wish you all a very happy day.